Well, good morning. As you would have your Bibles out, go ahead and flip over a few chapters if you were in Judges 13, but now turn to Judges chapter 16, please. Judges chapter 16. We're going to begin reading here in verse 21. Judges 16 and verse 21. Listen to what this says. It says, And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground at the mill in the prison. This passage is talking about Samson. Samson, one of the mightiest men to ever live. But how how did he end up here? How did Samson end up here? That's a question we're really going to be focusing in on this morning. And you think about Samson and who he was. He he was a judge, which really during this time served as a military leader and conqueror of God's people. He, He was strong and filled with supernatural strength. And maybe you're here, you've never read the story of Samson, never read the book of Judges. We learn, it's later revealed, that part of that strength that he had to do unreal things came from his hair. And a lot of hair from what we read. We read about how he killed 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey. Hebrews 11 mentions him as a hero and an example of faith. And yet despite all of this and all the accolades that Samson racks up in his life, all the great deeds that he does, Judges 16 and verse 21, what we just read is a disastrous situation that he finds himself in. At the very end of his life, he finds himself in utter disaster. And so again, how how did Samson end up here? How did he end up there? Brethren, Samson's life reveals a number of facts that we need to study and we need to learn for ourselves. Lest we find ourselves in a similar situation that Samson found himself in. And I'm not saying that we're going to find ourselves in a place where we're going to be bound up and having our eyes gouged out. No. But we might be able to have a lot of similarities with the life of Samson where we might too find ourselves in a place of spiritual disaster, spiritual destruction. And so we're going to examine the choices that Samson made and the consequences of those decisions. And in doing so, I think we're going to find very easily and very quickly how Samson ended up where he found himself in Judges chapter 16 and verse 21. So if you want to place a marker in Judges 16, we're going to be in chapters 14 through 16 for the majority of this lesson. I'm going to look at three facts from the life of Samson. And the outline for this lesson was borrowed uh, from an article by Brother Roger Schaus. So I want to definitely thank him for supplying the outline and some of the ideas around this lesson. But first, what we learn about Samson. One of the facts that led to where Samson ended up in, at the very end of his life was, first, he did what he wanted to do. Samson did what he wanted to do. And if you're familiar with the story of Samson at all, maybe you can't remember all the details that happened, all the different information that's inclo- included throughout his life, you can probably remember this. That a lot of what we remember about Samson is him just doing what he wants to do. And this is really illustrated from the first words out of his mouth. In Judges chapter 14, first time that we really see Samson coming on the scene. You know, chapter 13 is talking about his birth, the prayer of his father Manoah, and all those different things taking place. But then Judges chapter 14, listen to how it starts. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Get her for me. And I know it's definitely a different culture than we're living in today. That's not really how things work, especially in the country, America, that we live in. But this is what he does. He says, get her for me as my wife. And one author said Samson went down to Timnah geographically, but it's also the beginning of his spiritual decline. And that's noteworthy because this is the first mention that we have of Samson. The first thing that we have him, that we're told about him doing. Where is he going? Going down to Timnah. But we see that from the very first instance here with Samson, he acts, off, he acts based off what feels and what looks good. And this happens at multiple instances throughout his life. You look down in verse 3 after his parents tried to persuade him and say, Are you sure about this? Do you really want this woman from Timnah? And he says, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. 
You go over to chapter 16 and verse 1. It says, Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. Brethren, what we see is Samson did what he wanted to do. If it felt good, if it looked good, he was going to have it. He was going to take it. And that was the philosophy. That was the way that he conducted his life. But I want to take a quick, quick, quick detour away from the book of Judges because something that we don't just see in, in the life of Samson, but more broadly we see in the Bible, is this really a formula uh, for sin that Samson definitely illustrates. That there's a warning, a spiritual danger and warning in making decisions based off of what you see and acting on it. For instance, you think about in Genesis 3, what happened there? Eve saw that the tree was good. She saw that it was a delight to the eyes, and so what did she do? She took that which she was not supposed to have, and it resulted in sin. Joshua chapter 7, you remember the story about Achan there. He saw that the bounty was good. He wanted it, and so it says that he coveted it into his heart, and he took it. He hid the possession. The result Sin was in the camp and had to be dealt with there in Joshua 7. 2 Samuel 11, we talked about this in the Bible class this morning. It was referenced. You think about David. He saw Bathsheba. He saw her. And it could have stopped there. We're going to see things as Christians, brethren. We're going to see things that we want. We're going to see things that appeal to us, things that are delightful. And it's not necessarily a sin to see those things. But how quickly that can turn into a covetousness heart. A lusting after things. And so what does the text tell us there in 2 Samuel 11? He sent messengers and took Bathsheba. And the result there is sin in a large scale. And we see this definitely in the life of Samson. He lived a reckless life because he did what he wanted to do. Despite having strict instructions that he was supposed to live by. That there was a code, there was a way that he was supposed to live because not only was he a judge, we think about this, Samson was a Nazarite. And he took, his parents had to take a Nazarite vow before he was born. This idea that he was set apart. He was supposed to be holy in how he lived. This passage that Josh read for us in the scripture reading in Judges chapter 13 verses 1 through 5 over there, did you notice the three things that Nazarites had to abstain from? Three things. Maybe you write it down, underline it in your Bible. Just make a note of it. Three things they had to abstain from. One, they could not drink wine or strong drink. Second, they could not eat anything unclean. Had to stay away from things that were unclean. And third, they were not to shave their head. Could not shave their head. And yet, in the short chapters that we have details recorded about the life of Samson, he failed fantastically in every regard of this Nazarite vow. In every way. I mean, he was a fantastic failure. And that sounds a little bit ironic, but you look through his life, and you begin to see, and you begin to question, what, what is Samson doing? Why is he doing it this way? For instance, Judges chapter 14 and verse 5. I'm not going to read all these verses. I'll try and put them up here because we got a lot to go through. Judges 14 and verse 5, it mentions that Samson is in a vineyard. And vineyards are forbidden in the law of Moses, especially to those who were a Nazarite. And so what is he doing putting himself in the middle of a vineyard? Whether or not he drank it is kind of beside the point. He's putting himself in a tempting situation. It would be like a recovering alcoholic in a bar. It's just asking for trouble. You go to verse 9 of chapter 14. Samson is doing what? He's touching a dead carcass in that instance. Because what was inside the dead carcass? One of the weirder stories from this encounter. Well, there was some honey in the dead carcass. And when he gets that honey and he brings it back to his parents, it's interesting. He doesn't tell his parents where he got it from. And so I think that's a passage there that gives wisdom to parents. Always ask when your kids bring you something. Where do you get this from? In Judges 14 and verse 10, this one may just be a verse we breeze right on past. It says that Samson prepared a feast there. That word for feast in the Hebrew language, often denotes a feast of heavy alcohol and strong drink. A riotous feast. Again, something that Nazarites were supposed to abstain from. 
You see in Judges chapter 15, 3 and following down there, we see that Samson is handling foxes. But according to Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 27, foxes are unclean animals. But in a moment of rage where he's so mad at the Philistines, he grabs the closest thing to him, sets a field on fire, handling something that is unclean. In Judges chapter 15 and verse 15, we see him killing a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. And we typically go to that and be like, wow, look at Samson. And it does highlight his strength. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on and what his role was as a judge to conquer the Philistines. But in his rage, once again, he uses an unclean instrument to accomplish this feat. So do you see the point here? So many of the verses, so many of the instances that we have recorded and left for us to learn from the life of Samson illustrate the point that he did as he pleased. He did what he wanted to do. Samson had power without purity. He had strength without self-control. And he followed his own heart rather than following God. And that needs to serve as a warning for us today as servants of God. That if you live a life with no discipline, you live a life simply acting off of instinct and what feels right, what looks good, and just taking it as it comes, is that the life that God is going to want you to live? Is that the life that we have revealed for us in the New Testament that we're supposed to be living? Living a reckless, undisciplined life is easy. That's why so many do it. But we need to learn from Samson because what did he gain? What what was the outcome of his selfish lifestyle? We read about that at the very beginning of the sermon. As he's in chains, having his eyes gouged out. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 is a passage that says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. I think that verse there is obviously talking about spiritual death, spiritual destruction. And the life of Samson is a commentary on the truth of that proverb. And so that's one of the first facts that we see from the life of Samson, how he ended up where he did in Judges chapter 16. But second, what we see from the life of Samson is that he associated with the wrong people. And so I want to play a word association game. You can, you can answer this out loud if you want. Who's the first person that comes to mind when I say Samson and... You guys all said Delilah? Why? Why? Why not God? He, he was a judge of God, right? Why not, why not Manoah? That was his father. Oh, it's so hard to talk about Samson without talking about Delilah. It's hard. But I want you to think more broadly for a second about the women that Samson had relationships with. We're only given the name of one, and that is uh, Delilah. We first see in Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, he had a wife that was taken from Timnah. Judges chapter 16, at that chapter, begins that he was with a harlot from Gaza. And Delilah was from Sorek. What do all these three women have in common? Might be tough, especially if you've never really studied the book of Judges, unfamiliar with the people of the Philistines, but Timnah, Gaza, and Sorek, all cities of the Philistines. And these were the women that Samson was attracted to and who he finds himself associating with throughout this book. And a simple point is when you hang around the Philistines, you're going to act like the Philistines. And we start to see that behavior be true in the life of Samson. And we began asking the question this morning, and really the focus of our lesson is how did Samson end up here? How did he end up there in Judges chapter 16 at the very end of his life, helpless, a captive of the enemy? And I believe that the women in Samson's life play a key part in that. And that's why in Judges chapter 14, you have his father, Manoah, who tried to sway him away from picking the women of the Philistines when he says, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And his father comes back and says, you sure about that? You don't want to marry one one of the daughters of Israel? You don't want to marry somebody of your own people? He says, get her for me. She's right in my eyes. And his father, Manoah, That's a whole lesson for another day. 
about Manoah. Some of you were talking with me about this earlier. The, the prayer that he prayed in chapter 13 and the fact that his wife was barren and they're blessed with a child and it seems like they're doing everything right, but then they let Samson do this. But you think about the advice that his father was trying to heed. Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 4, but I'm going to read from Joshua chapter 23. At the very end of Joshua's, Joshua's life, Joshua is taking the advice, taking the commandments from God, from Deuteronomy chapter 7, and he's echoing that. He's reminding the people of Israel. He sees a temptation that's coming up in the future. That whole generation that was with Moses in the wilderness wandering and the new people that had come up and been raised with the law, that first generation, they're dying off. And in Joshua 23, Joshua is reminding them the importance of following God Notice what he says in verses 11 through 13. He says, Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. But they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And would you look at that? The, the truth of this verse unfolds in the life of Samson, but also in the whole entire book of Judges as a whole. The women that Samson surrounded himself with quite literally became a trap and a snare for him, thorns in his eyes. And we see that so plainly with his relationship with Delilah. And you read through the story of Samson. You start in Judges 13, you go through the end in Judges chapter 16. I read it several times this weekend, and I found myself scratching my head and thinking, you know, why didn't Samson connect the dots? Every time he got around these different women of the Philistines, bad things happened. He got into trouble. Part of me thinks that well, maybe that's what he wanted. That, that could be part of it. We see that from the wife of Timnah, he ends up killing her and her father. That's a dark aspect we leave out in the kids' classes. But then it leads to him killing 1,030 of the Philistines, at least. The prostitute, well, that, that almost got him captured. He ends up escaping and carries a gate that probably weighed who knows how many pounds, 1,000, 2,000 pounds, carries it 35 miles to Hebron as a statement for the Philistines. That gives us a little bit of a glimpse of the power that Samson had. With Delilah, what happens? Well, he, he keeps testing, keeps pushing his luck, and eventually it catches up with him. Eventually he's captured by the Philistines. And I do, I do want to be fair to the text. Judges 14 and verse 4 is a verse I haven't, we haven't read yet, I haven't mentioned. But it definitely makes it clear that part of Samson's interactions with the Philistines is to do the Lord's will. That this could have been from God's hand because he was supposed to deliver God's people from the Philistines. So he had to get close to the Philistines. He had to interact with them in some way. But I'm not going to use that verse to justify all of the actions of Samson's life. We look and we learn from Samson's life. He became so emboldened by him strength that he assumed he could handle living among the Philistines at all times. But a question I want us to think about today is, are we so different? We think about the people we put ourselves around, the situations we find ourselves in. Maybe it's with the spouse. Maybe it's with our friends. Maybe it's with coworkers. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 speaks to this, where it says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And that's a good reminder. And I know the context of that passage is talking about, you know, the resurrection. That how we view our faith and the people that we spend time around, if they view things a whole lot differently, suddenly that can change the way that we view truth, the way we view the Bible, the way we view morality. People that we spend time around, they impact us. And I know so many times we say we're Christians, it won't impact us, it doesn't make a difference. Until we look at a story like Samson and we see the impact that people made on his life. If we keep close company with the world, we become like the world, which is always going to put us as Christians in a tough place because the world is at enmity with God, James 4 and verse 4. So for those of us who are called out, we are set apart from the world. We need to make sure that we're doing our best to shine as lights in a sin-darkened world. 
You know, a common expression I would always tell this to my soccer players when I was coaching them was, show me your friends and I'll show you, my, I'll show you your future. And I know that's not an ironclad statement. Sometimes things change and it ends a lot better, but I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. We need to make sure we're doing our best to find godly friends. You know, find a kingdom-oriented spouse. Seek out friends that are going to hold you accountable, not encourage you to compromise your convictions. We need to be around people that draw us closer to God. And the life of Samson teaches us that if we become attached to the ungodly, it can lead us down a slippery slope away from the Lord. But the third fact that we're going to end with from the life of Samson it is a sad one here, that the Lord departed from Samson. And it's so sad, not just that the Lord departed from Samson, but that the Lord departed from him and he didn't even know what happened. He didn't even know. Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. This is right as he's been, you know, testing his luck with Delilah. She's trying to find out, basically been outsourced by the Philistines to try and discover the strength, the key to the strength of Samson. How is he so strong? And he keeps telling her things, but they're not true. And finally he breaks down. She wore him down. He gives in, tells her that it's his hair. And so here we are in Judges 16, verses 18 through 19, and we see that Delilah, I mean, Samson falls asleep on the knees of Delilah, has his hair cut. And in verse 20, she says, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as, any, as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And what follows that verse is the verse we began with of his capture, his torture, and his subsequent be being in the hands of the enemy. I mean, what a sad, sad verse to read. He did not know that the Lord had left him. And I think that serves as a frightening warning to us today. Maybe it's possible for us to do the Lord's work, but fail to be devoted to God. Maybe it's possible to do the Lord's work but fail to be devoted to God. Meaning, I can go to worship, I can go to church, but yet my heart be far away from the Lord. Meaning, I can come to this building, but I may not be worshiping, I may just be warming a pew. I can give to the poor, I can pray repeatedly, I can fast twice a week, and I can do all those things, and yet... All that could be only for myself and not for God. We've been talking about that for Matthew chapter 6. It reminds me of Matthew 7, 21 through 23, that, that there's always people that are going to claim that they know the Lord, that they do good works, even in His name, but that doesn't always mean that they've done the will of the Father. And I think we see a lot of that from the life of Samson. Because it's always so easy for us to assume that God is with us. God's always with us. Have you noticed that as Christians? We always say that. God's with us. God, God is for us. God is always blessing us. And I know there's passages that teach that, but hear me out in the complete context of what I'm saying. Because I believe too often we take God for granted. Maybe even abuse our relationship with Him and assume that God is blessing us for every good thing that we have when that may not be the case. I mean, have we not learned from the Bible that not everything that occurs in our life is a direct result of God blessing us or a direct result of God cursing us? Sometimes the rain falls on the wicked. Sometimes the rain falls on the just. But anytime something good happens, what do we do? We attribute it to God, saying that, well, God's the one that gave me this job. God's the one that gave me this promotion. God's the one that answered this prayer. How do we know that? We need to be careful when we speak for God. I need to be careful not just to assume that the physical condition of my life, the physical blessings that I enjoy, is not always equivalent, not always an equivalent parallel with the condition of my spiritual life. And that's where I'm going with it. That's the danger that I think we run into. We look at the life of Samson and we see that he was a slave of the Philistines more than he was a slave of God. But what about us? Is that, could that be true of us in our lives? Are we more slaves of sin than we are slaves of righteousness? Or do we just presume that, you know, we've been baptized, I became a Christian, 
We read, we proof text passages in Romans that say God is with us. Who can be against us? And we go through life assuming that that's always going to be the case when maybe we're living as a slave of unrighteousness. Judges 16, as we mentioned, is a hard, it's a sad chapter to read. Because for years, Samson towed the line of danger. And because of that, Delilah is able to cut his hair and have the Philistines capture him. He wakes up. The text tells us in verse 20 of Judges 16, he wakes up ready to fight, saying that he will do it just as before, only to find out that the Lord had left him because he didn't even realize that occurred. No, I, I imagine on Judgment Day, Imagine on Judgment Day that there are going to be people like Samson who learn that the Lord left them and they never even realized it. And I wish that happens to no one. I wish that happens to no one. But at the same time, if we make ourselves a slave to sin and we focus on doing what we want, we make ourselves a slave of unrighteousness, can we truly expect to be with the Lord? I would argue that many of us, we still would say yes. Because this was a problem that was happening at Rome. Paul had to deal with this same issue, that the Jewish Christians at Rome were expecting this very thing. And Paul had to correct their thinking. We're going to finish by reading this passage here. Romans chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of, God, on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render the each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For time's sake, I wish we could read Romans 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, to really make this point. Because the Jews, they looked at the wickedness of the Gentiles, that's explained in chapter 1, and they looked at that and they got it. They looked at that, they saw it for what it was, and they saw it as wickedness. They were able to point it out and say, that is wrong. That is immoral. That that is wicked. And then in chapter 2, Paul tells them, you were doing the very same thing. And you know what that makes them? Hypocrites. They're able to see it in other people, but they fail. They're oblivious to the sin in their own life. And where am I going with this? Well, what a shame it would be for us if we spend this lesson looking at Samson, recognizing all of his flaws, all of his shortcomings, saying, how is he so selfish? Look, he, he did exactly what he wanted to do. He spent his time around the wrong people. What if we're guilty of living by the very same standard? What if we're guilty of doing the very same things in our lives? Brethren, let's be a people who seek God's glory who seek God's honor, who seek immortality, as Romans 2 point out, that we may find what? Eternal life. Because you look at the story of Samson, and it ends in him crushing the Philistines in a collapsing arena that took his own life. And some of you may may be thinking, when is PJ going to say it? I'm going to say it now. Hebrews 11 mentions Samson's name as a hero and an example of faith. There are things that we can learn from Samson's life that are good lessons, that in ways he foreshadowed as a, in, in, is a witness to the coming of Christ. And so there are positive things from his life. But I think we also need to be fair. We also need to see that his life took long periods in the wilderness. And for some today, for some Christians, they aren't so fortunate. 
They go out in the wilderness and they never come back. Their story, our story, doesn't always end with a Hebrews 11 approval. For some people, they die among the Philistines acting like a Philistine. And I think our lives get so messy like Samson when we think we know better than God. When we live our life doing exactly what we want to do. And we know that foolishness has ended many souls. And let's be sure that we learn from Samson unless we find ourselves down a path of spiritual destruction. If you're here this morning and you are a child of God, but maybe you recognize that your heart is far away from the Lord. Maybe you come to your, have come to your senses and you realize that maybe the Lord's departed from me because I departed from him years ago. It's time to come back. It's time to come home, make things right with the Lord. But maybe you're here this morning and you are not a Christian. Maybe you've been reading your Bible, been reading about the New Testament, the story of the cross, understanding the gospel and what Jesus has done, that he's died, that you can be forgiven of your sins. And you're ready to begin your walk, your relationship with him. Ready to repent of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. We'd be so happy to assist you with that here this morning. So if you're here and subject to heaven's invitation in any way, we invite you to come up front as we stand and sing the song selected.